Agents are the future, but RAG is the present. And now we're going to talk about the present. If you're wondering how this whole generative AI stuff can help your business, there's a surprisingly clear answer, and it's RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. It is by far the easiest way to get your own data into a large language model application, and therefore making large language models controllable and actually useful for business applications. There is a million different ways you can set up a RAG kind of system, but now I'm going to show you a really beautiful way how you can do this with what's next. And for that, I invented a company, Galaxium Travels. We offer space travel. We don't have a product yet, but we already have some internal business documents. And that is what we need right now to build a rack system. After finishing the whole video, I realized that this is missing a rack 101, what are we even talking about part. So if you know what rack is, just jump to the next chapter. If not, stick around. This is your, I don't know, three minute quick overview. So what are we even trying to solve? Well, it's pretty simple. We try to get our data, our documents, our knowledge into a large language model system. If we try to do this really naively and just have our assistant directly talk to a large language model, we're not going to get any useful answers. Because obviously, if we ask it for the 2025 strategic roadmap for Galaxium Travel, it's not going to know anything about it. I mean, how should it? It's going to tell us something like, I don't know, or probably even a lot worse, it's going to make up something. We don't even know that we're being fed completely hallucinated information. How does RAG solve this? First thing you need to do is get the data that you care about. I don't know, business plan, any reports, whatever your documents are, any technical documentation, whatever you care about, you put it into a vector database. I'm not going to go into detail how the whole thing about embeddings and vector databases work. Just remember that there is a very small large language model that pre-processes all of your documents, all of your text in a way that makes them searchable in a really clever way. And that means you do not search on a word per word basis, but you can actually search for meaning, like how close together it is the meaning of two sentences or documents. This part truly is kind of magical. And I highly encourage you to dive deeper if you're interested. But for now, that's good enough of an understanding. Now that we have that vector database, we can program our assistant to take our query, the thing that we've been asking, and look in this vector database for documents that are related on a meaning basis. Like I'm waving my hands here. This is kind of magical, but it's going to find the documents that are best suitable to answer those questions. Then we can take those documents and simply add them to our prompt. So this is all happening under the hood. You as a user don't see that, but the system takes your original question and adds the documents that it found in the vector database to that prompt. And well, the way you do that is pretty simple, just in plain English. You just add, use only this information I found in my database for your answer. And then you add the actual relevant data. It turns out large language models are really good following those kind of instructions. And in reality, it usually works really well that the answer that the model gives you actually really is based on the information that you provided here. And in this simple example, it correctly tells us that Galaxium plans to have their first commercial flights in 2025. Additionally to being pretty much the only way you can make this scenario works, this whole approach comes with a huge load of benefits that makes it suitable for a lot of different scenarios. Some of those benefits are that whenever your data changes, you just throw out that file, replace it in the vector database, and you have updated your knowledge base. Also, if your system generates answers that you don't like for some reason, this gives you a real way to dig in there and find the documents that it used to generate the answer and actually find issues and solve issues. That's pretty much the best way you can build trust in your AI system. Because of all those benefits, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, is by far the most common architecture pattern you see in the field of generative AI. So if you're not already using RAG in your organization, it's quite likely that you should. I bet you there's at least one use case that would really benefit from a Retrieval Augmented Generation approach. Now that we've got the theory out of the way, let's start building. Quick note, if you enjoy the content I'm making, it really helps if you subscribe to the channel, leave an upvote or even a comment. Now 
back to the video. Thanks. So let's jump straight into the Watson X platform. I have already created a project for us. Let me zoom in a little. And we just open the prompt lab. Here we can choose a lot of different models. Um, some nice small IBM models, some nice small Llama models. For this use case, we're just gonna use one of the, the big Llama models just to make our lives a bit easier. If we now ask it something about Galaxium Travel, it's obviously gonna produce nonsense. Like, okay, that's kind of a nice text, but nothing to do with the company that we just made up. Now let's add our own data. You might have already noticed this little button down here. We can upload our documents. There are a few different possibilities here. Uh, we're gonna go over the easiest one for now in memory. Later, I'm gonna show you how you can add your own Milvus database. It can actually handle quite a lot of different file types, even PowerPoints and PDFs. But for our use case, we just have some very plain old TXT files. I'm gonna drag and drop all of them in here. It already created a name for us. Mm, I'm gonna change it, Galaxium Documents. Here under advanced settings, we have some of the most important parameters that you have for a rack system. You can choose your embedding model, which is the model that pre-processes your data before it goes into the vector database. You've got chunk size and chunk overlap, how big your chunks of data are. Just gonna leave that at default for now. Now we can hit create. So what we have just done, if you watch the RAG 101 chapter, we've done this part, the whole get your data into the vector database part. And I would say that was pretty simple. And now we can already start asking it questions. What is Galaxium Travel? And that is a very reasonable answer. That is exactly aligned with the documents that I just uploaded. We can also ask the question from the PowerPoint presentation. What's the 2025 strategic roadmap? This is exactly the correct answer. So that's kind of nice so far, but now we've got this here in the What's Next platform. Like, should your users always log into this platform and do all the stuff that we just did to ask questions? That does not make much sense. We want to use this somewhere else, and there is a super easy way to do this. It's a little bit hidden, to be honest, but if you have to do save as, and then notebook deployable Gen AI flow. You then have to specify your deployment space, which is the abstraction layer that handles the compute that is necessary. You also have to give it a name, which is called a Galaxium. We don't need a description. Let's just save it. If we jump into the project, you see that we've got a notebook here. Let's check that out. There's a lot of code and I'm gonna go straight into the edit mode. Now we can actually execute the code. I'm gonna, not gonna go into detail, otherwise this is gonna take like 10 minutes or so. I'm just gonna jump over it and explain the main concepts. This already has the main credentials that you need pre-configured. The only thing that we need is our API key. I'm gonna show you where you can find it. I just logged into IBM Cloud and I go to Manage Access IAM API Keys and I'm gonna create a new one. Demo Galaxium. Create. Remember to copy this because you can only see and copy it once. Now let's go back to our notebook, paste this in here, enter. And that's pretty much all we needed to change. Now we can run through all those cells. And that is the interesting part. I personally absolutely love this because this is the whole code that this rack system is using, like everything is in here. And that means you can also change it if you want. You can see the prompt that it's using. It's just right there, you can change it if you like. Uh, you got all the parameters here, uh, all the logic is, is in here. It's as transparent as it can be. And yet, if you don't care about it, you just execute that cell and there you go. We wanna deploy this. Again, for that, we pretty much only have to execute those cells. There's literally nothing we have to do. So after about, I don't know, two minutes, we've got our REC solution deployed. And now we can just throw our question in here for testing purposes and see if it works. This answer looks really good, but still, this is not what we wanna do. I mean, we don't want our 
business users to go through a Jupyter notebook and execute 20 cells. We want to use this somewhere and we're almost there. Like we got this deployed. We can consume this now from pretty much anywhere. For that, I have a very simple Streamlit app. I'm going to link the code in the description below and it's super simple to start. And now we can ask some questions here. And we're gonna ask the same question that we're asking every time. What is the 2025 strategic roadmap? And here we've got our answer and it's looking really good. And it's even referencing its sources. So this Streamlit app obviously is only one of many, many options that you have to consume this kind of system. You can integrate it into any chatbot system, into Slack, into WhatsApp. You can literally set this up in 10 minutes if you know what you're doing. What we've done is this whole system is what we've got now, which I find is pretty awesome, but it gets even better. If you are kind of a technical person and you paid really close attention, then you might have noticed that we have packaged all of this into one function, which practically means into one pod, one Kubernetes or OpenShift pod. So that means all of the database, all the data lives in one pod. So that won't scale. But what we can do now is take this whole database, move it in a much, much more scalable system. And we can do this using the very same tooling. You can literally start with what we just did and scale it pretty much to infinity just right from there and you will never have a break in your developer experience. The best way to do this is to use what's next data and use the Milvus database that's included in it. That gives you, takes away a lot of the headache about maintaining and scaling the solution. But if you just wanna build something small and wanna get started, there's a easier option. Milvus is completely open source. It's one of the leading vector databases and you can just host it yourself. And that's what I did. I just created a little AWS EC2 instance. It's cost me like, I don't know, a few cents an hour. I then ran a few very basic Docker commands that I'm just gonna link in a documentation down under this video. And I then ended up with my own Milbus instance with a Atto UI laid over it. You can take this same setup really, really far. You can scale this over whole clusters. You can embed GPUs. Like you can go crazy with Milvus. The great part is that it is super easy to integrate. And we're here in the very same prompt lab that we just left. And then I just go to grounding with documents. Oh, uh, we have to clear the chat real quick. And now we can choose our vector index. And here we've got this Galaxium documents, which was created for us just by the process of uploading the documents, what I've shown in the first half of this video. But we can also create a new vector index. And here we can you choose Milvus. It says what's next data Milvus, but you can use your own Milvus instance as well. Now we have to create a connection, give it a name, Milvus EC2 instance, for example. We just need the IP and the port. Ah, the database name is default. We don't have any credentials configured, so we just type anything in there. Obviously, this is not recommended, but this is a super simple demo and we're not even SSL enabled. Let's test the connection first. The test was successful. Let's create the connection. Quick note here. I, I'm from Germany and that is actually very relevant when we talk about large language models and everything that I've shown here works really well in German as well and probably in most other European languages. Just hit next and we can create a new collection. I already created those two from previous tests. Ah, I, I love this, this is like so simple. You can just give it a name. Those parameters are super relevant when you're trying to improve the performance of your system. Those things are really important. But for now, we can just leave them as they are. We don't even have to upload the documents again. We can just use them straight from here. Dup, 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 dup. Select create and this takes a moment because under the hood it's also executing some python code and I, i'm really excited about this like you can even check out the python code that it used to ingest the data into your milvus database it's it's right here just here and aws ec2 milvus build and that's everything that happened under the hood so if you've got an existing system it doesn't become more modular and more approachable than this 
So you can do your data ingestion from anywhere. You can do all sorts of pre-processing in here if you want. Like it's right here and it's executed in a pipeline. Like you can automate this. This is super simple and still super powerful. If we now check in the UI of our Milvus database, we can see that our data is here. We can do vector searches on it. We can like go into a lot of detail here if we want, but we do not have to. We do not have to because it just works. And let me just ask a question here. And there we go, it works. Like we've gone from just trying it out, doing a first test to a potentially completely scalable solution. And I, I could do this in like half an hour, I think, maybe an hour. Like this is really amazing. And it all is using the same tooling, the same UI, the same developer and the same user experience. You might have noticed, I'm really excited about this. Retrieval augmented generation first showed up in like 2023 and now it matured all the way through 2024 and by now it is really easy to use, really easy to implement and really easy to scale. I said it before in this video, if you're not using retrieval augmented generation yet, you might want to really think about that. If any of this sounded interesting to you, reach out to me, check out my other videos, shoot me a message on LinkedIn, whatever suits you, I'm always happy to chat. Bye bye.